I think about some of the letters that I got and uh, wish I had a, saved them. But uh, I threw them away because, you know, when, when I got these letters, was no, uh, why am I getting emotional about this, man? <laughs> had no, no uh, return address. And, you know, sitting at your locker, you start reading and you realize, you know, how crude people were. I can remember receiving a box, nice wrap box, man. And I opened it. And it was it was a rotten watermelon. And big note that say, throw this to the ends and see could they catch this. I'm Charles Davis. On behalf of my esteemed colleague and terrific friend, Mr. Steve Weish, it is an honor to host tonight's event. Black College Football, The Road to Equality. It's very important for us to celebrate the remarkable achievements of individuals that have paved the way for not only football players, coaches, or athletes, but minorities across the nation. It's equally important for us to know the civil rights struggles and challenges these great men faced. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been only a little more than 55 years that a young African-American man has been able to choose the college of his choice. The road to equality was and is still a difficult journey. By the end of tonight's program, it is our hope you will learn about the immense impact historically black colleges and universities have had on the sport of football and American history. We're here to help raise funds for educational and football programs at historically black colleges and universities and the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Please be sure to donate tonight and visit the auction. For our friends joining us for the first time that may be asking, what are HBCUs? Here's a quick history lesson. Historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, were established to serve the educational needs of black Americans. Prior to the Civil War, there was no structured higher education system for aspiring black students. Public policy and societal norms prohibited the education of blacks in various parts of the country. The Institute for Colored Youth, the first higher education institution for blacks, was founded by a group of Quakers in Cheney, Pennsylvania in 1837. Over the succeeding decades, more than 100 other colleges and universities for black students arose in the United States, with the vast majority of those institutions springing up in the South. Some of them were founded by white philanthropists or liberal religious groups committed to educating and elevating a formerly enslaved people. Many others, however, were created by politicians in the South as a means of preserving the iron rule of segregation and the inequality in education. Despite the cynical design, these colleges served as the agency of black achievement and the epicenter of black pride. For more than a century, these colleges produced the vast majority of America's black professionals. Well, thanks so much, Charles. And before we hear from some of the greatest football players, coaches, and contributors from HBCUs, we must know the history of this great sport. Black college football began play in 1892 when Biddle College, now known as Johnson T. Smith, visited Livingstone College in Salisbury, North Carolina. With segregation well established and heavily managed with Jim Crow laws, Following World War I, college football ignited the passions of patriotism, pride, and school spirit as America found its new pastime. From the cotton fields of the South to the slums of major cities, young black boys dreamed of glory in this newfound game, with the only problem being that they couldn't play the sport wherever they wanted. In the 50s and the 60s, where black football players typically didn't play, and they definitely didn't play at the Southern schools, but even, even at the northern schools, they were in limited numbers. So where did they play? They played at HBCUs. When, when you start thinking about the talent and you think about the players that were at those HBCUs because they couldn't play at Alabama, LSU, Georgia, South Carolina, places like that. So nowadays, 
those talented players would probably end up at larger schools, or a large number of them will. But at that time, they didn't have the alternative, and that's why it was so important. But I don't know if that story has always been amplified for its significance. There are so many uh, black college football players who had great pro careers that most people don't understand and realize that they went to historically black colleges and universities. And I'll give you just a few. Walter Payton, when he retired and for many years after, was the leading rusher in the National Football League, went to an HBCU. Jerry Rice, the all-time leading receiver in NFL history, went to an HBCU. Deacon Jones, maybe the, the greatest defensive end in the history of the game, went to an HBCU. Michael Strahan, the NFL's single season sack leader, HBCU. Jackie Slater, HBCU. Mel Blunt, HBCU. Lem Barney, an HBCU. Art Shell, HBCU. John Stallworth, HBCU. These are players who obviously went on to great stardom in the NFL, and I keep coming back to this. They're not unique. There were great players coming out of the historically black colleges and universities, but the doors of professional football were not always open to them. It really wasn't until the 1960s, and primarily because of the uh, new American Football League, who were looking for good players. And they had to go a little colorblind to find some, and they did. And then that opened the doors in the then rival NFL. Bill Nunn, a great uh, uh, Pittsburgh Courier sports editor, became an employee of the Pittsburgh Steelers to scout historically black colleges and universities, found players like Mel Blunt uh, to play for the Steelers. So there was a wealth of talent in these schools. They just had to be invited to the dance. There are 31 Pro Football Hall of Famers from HBCUs. These men paved the way for some of the great talent we have seen in recent years in the NFL from HBCUs. Guys like Tariq Cohen with the Chicago Bears come to mind. But in addition, not only did these men pave the way for guys to get to the NFL, they paved the way for all of us to have pride in who we are, who we have a chance to become, and give us an opportunity to look out there and say we can accomplish things in this world. I am the product of an HBCU football player. Franklin Davis, now in New Paltz, New York, was the starting quarterback for the Bluefield State Big Blues back in the late 50s. A tremendous man, an incredible role model, someone I am so proud to be his son, and a big reason why I continue to watch and support the HBCUs here today. So when they see the amount, the, the number of guys that played in the black colleges and universities, the guys that's been that's in the pro, pro Football Hall of Fame, the guys that's in the Black College Football Hall of Fame, their jaws are gonna drop. Because I, I had my, my, my son, uh, the year that I was inducted here a couple of years ago, and his jaw dropped because he said, I didn't know this guy played in a black college. You know, people don't know this. They're very excited, uh, excited about seeing that, yes, the black colleges can produce very good football players. The Black College Football Hall of Fame was established in 2009 and held its inaugural induction ceremony in 2010. What did the establishment of the Black College Football Hall of Fame mean to the inaugural inductees? Let's hear from one of them, the man that invented the sack, David Deacon Jones. There are a lot of things in life that, uh, that we try to accomplish during our course and direction. A lot of advantages we have, some of us don't have advantages. I got a chance tonight to meet the last guy that I had not met, Dr. King's staff, Ambassador Young, a guy who I had wanted to shake his hand and thank him for his services because I came into this league in 1961. We did not have a black quarterback. We did not have a black coach. We did not have a black offensive guard. We did not have a black tight end. We did not have a lot of positions that we weren't allowed to play. I took my responsibility very seriously. My responsibility, when the door cracked, kick it in, Deacon. This is very important for me to walk in this room and see all the youngsters back there. The real story has to be told to them. They must move this on. People have to know what we went through. 
to get to this point. It's not been easy. Anybody in this room who was old enough to understand how it was should have a tear in the eye tonight because this wasn't in the plan. We had not thought about this. This was the honor. The thing was, to get a good education, to go to a school that's qualified, to get a shot at playing against the best competition. That's all. It wasn't nothing big. It shouldn't have been a big deal. Can't tell me I can't play against somebody. Still can't tell me that. <laughs> Haven't had a TMI in I don't know how long. Haven't had a TMI in I don't know how long. This is very important to me. You know, having had to get to the pros to play against a white guy. First white guy I hit was in the pros. I'm ashamed of that, and I'm happy about that. But I'm ashamed of that. That shouldn't have been. And we traveled by bus, which meant that uh, we were subject to uh, highway patrolmen, uh, interfering sometimes. I remember we were going through Mississippi and they stopped us and made us go back to a certain town. We had to get license to go through. We had trouble getting food to eat. Uh, they wouldn't serve us uh, in most of the eating places. We had trouble with uh, restrooms at service stations. They, they tell us we had no place for you, no restroom where you could go. I said, now you've got college graduates in here from some of the best schools in the country. He has an all-American ride with me, and we're not good enough to use your toilet. It's hell to be a black man in the deep south. You know, it was heavy, heavy civil rights time, and every Friday night, there was a cross burn right here. This is lemon and plank. Then a mile down the road, at the next intersection by where I grew up, you would see the same thing. They would burn across at each, each intersection. When LSU was playing Ole Miss, when Ole Miss had to come to Baton Rouge, uh, we wasn't allowed on the streets because there was so many rebel flags that was coming down Plank Road and, and the things that had happened. Uh, you know, I remember once I went to the store for my grandmother. My grandmother lived probably about a half a mile uh, from us. And uh, I was walking back, and uh, I guess it was after the game, it was kind of late, and all of a sudden, a milkshake hit me smack dad in the face. You know, I'm so glad it was a milkshake, because it could have been a lot worse. A county, Prince Edward County, 50 miles from Richmond, shuttered all their schools versus complying with Brown versus Board of Education, which said that it was unequal to do as was being done. And the schools were shuttered from 1959 to 1964. So individuals who looked like me 50 miles away had no school to attend, took the money, and had a white academy. That didn't make sense to me. This is America. Education must have been important because someone was trying to deny it. One of the most scariest times in my life, I was invited to play in the East-West Swine game in California walking myself with children from Jackson State. We get on the elevator, and when the elevator hit the lobby floor, I was met with a shotgun up my nose and was asked to get on my on the floor with a shotgun up the, in the back of my head. That's when you realize that someone there had to recognized us and luckily the guy behind the, the desk recognized us as being college all-stars. You don't know how scary that was or how I felt at that moment because I had been sheltered for four years at a college of surrounded with people that cared about me, looked after me 24 hours a day, made sure I ate well and was taken care of. But to be that moment, all this to the end was very scary. Got to keep reminding you, please don't forget to donate tonight and make a bid on one of the auction items. Now, many of these HBCUs were tasked to do more with less. Hotel accommodations included the Bleacher Hotel 
meaning these teams didn't sleep in hotels when they traveled. They slept on gymnasium floors. In fact, some of these schools were left out of their state's budget. Still, these players and coaches pushed through and broke down barriers. In September 1967, after three years of landmark civil rights laws and three months of devastating urban riots, the football season began at Louisiana's Grambling College and Florida A&M. The teams were led by two extraordinary coaches, Eddie Robinson and Jake Gaither, and they featured the best quarterbacks ever at each school, James Shaq Harris and Ken Riley. The 1967 football season was really significant. First of all, it's happening at a pivotal time in the civil rights movement. So for the student athletes at all the HBCUs, and in Breaking the Line, I specifically focus on Grambling and FAMU. These were young men who had come of age after Brown versus Board of Ed, after the Montgomery School bus boycott, were in middle school at the time the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act were passed, and were in college watching those laws and that Supreme Court decision still be disobeyed in the South under the doctrine of massive resistance. And they were righteously angry and impatient themselves. And they were waiting for the coaches who they admired so much to take a stand. And up to 1967, Eddie Robinson, the head coach at Grambling, and Jake Gaither, the head coach at FAMU, had been very privately sympathetic to the movement, but had been reluctant to be publicly associated with it because both Grambling and FAMU were controlled by their state legislatures, the governors, the Board of Regents, and those um, political entities were entirely white and they controlled the purse strings. At um, Florida A&M, during, during the 1967 season, Jake Gaither was going behind the scenes and using all the political leverage he'd built up with the Board of Regents in the state of Florida to get permission, which would come two years later, permission to play the first game ever of an HBCU versus a PWI. Um, it was such a controversial decision, the Board of Regents wouldn't even put it down in writing. But during the 1967 season, Coach Gaither got the okay, and that epochal game, FAMU versus Tampa, took place two years later in 1969. Jake Gaither said that was the most important accomplishment in his entire coaching career, and his special guest at that game, watching from the press box, was Eddie Robinson from Grambling. Well, when Shaq and I came out, not only, uh, boy, you're talking about a great game that year. Uh, I don't know how many guys up to those two teams went on to play professional football. And Shaq always teased me today. He got me on it. I can't do nothing but eat it and say, okay, you beat me. In different ways, uh, James, Shaq Harris at Grambling, and Ken Riley at FAMU, the two star quarterbacks I write about in Breaking the Line, experienced the racial politics of playing quarterback in the NFL. Ken Riley came out of FAMU having completed, believe it or not, 90% of his passes in his senior year. He was picked in the sixth round by the Cincinnati Bengals. He was never even given a chance to play quarterback. When he got to training camp, he was told he'd be a cornerback, a position he had never played in his life. And he was such a fantastic student of the game such a hard worker, such work ethic, that at this brand new position, he became a starter in his first year and he had an illustrious 13 year career. He's fifth in the NFL, his, in NFL history in interceptions. But he never got the chance to play his real position. With James Harris, Eddie Robinson put the word out to the NFL that Shaq would not be willing to change positions. Don't even try. Don't try to make him into a tight end or defensive back or whatever the idea was. He was one of the top quarterbacks in the country in his senior year, but it wasn't taken until the eighth round by the Buffalo Bills. And he came into training camp, I think as number seven on the depth chart. And he was so outstanding though in camp that he ended up beating out everybody else in the opening day as a rookie. He was the starting quarterback that year. Um, that was the beginning of many, many firsts for Shaq Harris and the pros. The real apex of his career comes a few years later when he's with the L.A. Rams. And two years in a row, he takes the Rams to within one game of the Super Bowl. 
to the NFC Championship game. He's an All-Pro one of those years. He leads the league in passing efficiency twice. Um, but even then, when you think he'd finally broken through for good, the Rams' ownership overruling their own head coach, Chuck Knox, brings in no less than four white quarterbacks to try to compete with Harris for the job. And when none of them can beat him out, they trade him away at the height of his career to the San Diego Chargers. My name is James Shedd Harris from Grambling State University, Black College Football Hall of Fame class of 2012. Support the Black College Football Hall of Fame and the HBCUs. Help us encourage others to continue the road to equality and preserve our history. Before my father passed away, he asked me to use football to get a college degree for my mother. There were no roads to equality no job market. America was full of challenges, protests, segregation, cotton field. Nevertheless, my four-year Gremlin experience was some of the best years of my life. We cared for each other. We shared resources. We developed a camaraderie that lives on until this day. As I travel around the country and I see so many HBCU students and graduates doing well and making a difference, in our nation. I ask the parents and young people with college in their future, consider the HBCU experience. And remember, it's not the school or degree that makes a difference in your future. It's you and your work ethic that make a difference in your faith. Coach Eddie Robinson, the man who had a great impact on my life, would say, hell can in life, you win some and you lose some, but you prepare to win them all. Go Grandma. So what made the HBCUs different? Well, to me, you have to point to the coaches. In fact, legendary head coach Eddie Robinson, one of the winningest coaches in college football history, who won 408 games as a head coach at Grambling State University, sent over 200 players to the NFL. How about Big John Merritt, the head coach of Tennessee State from 1963 to 1983? He had five unbeaten teams and five others that lost only one game in a season. His teams were chosen by the Pittsburgh Courier seven times as the Black College National Champions. Coach Merritt coached 144 players who went into pro football. With little to no formal football training, many coaches like Coach Rob and Coach Merritt with little notoriety or glamour gave of themselves for the love of the game. These teachers of men faced with inferior facilities, less than stellar equipment, and very few venues in which to showcase their team's enormous talent, establish a trend that continues through today. Well, I think it's important that, uh, well, I believe we all change, but um, your philosophy and uh, things of that sort remain the same. It's still the same with me. I went in thinking that it, the most important thing was that they would get a degree and be able to compete in the most competitive society in the world. And it's still the same. I, I really look at uh, it like this. Uh, quite a few kids come to you. They want to play professional football. And if you aren't careful, they want to remain eligible to do that. And, uh, and you have to think about what happens if he's not able to play because only select you mm -hmm. uh, players are uh, able to come out of college and go into professional football so you have to talk to them about carrying on the academic uh, the academics along with the uh, with the athletics and this is what we've done through the years and this is what we'll continue to do he wanted to make sure that as players we understood yes I know you're black I see you yes I know you want the country to see you as black but before anything, the country has to see you as an American before they can respect your race. And that's a delicate situation you have to deal with throughout his entire coaching life. All these coaches, I think there was, there was, there was a calling on their lives to sow into the young men's lives uh, and student athletes' lives on that campus. Because as I'm listening to the coach here and then I'm listening to Coach Jeffries and uh, other coaches from HBCU school, they, they did it with a relatively little nothing at all. And, um, you know, Coach Hayes is describing how he, 40-some uh, years he coached and labored 
And the coach wanted to say, well, come on up to Division One." He said, well, all right, no, this is, this is where I, I need to be. Uh, not only did I coach football, I had to teach physical education. I taught gymnastics. So then that, you know, we didn't do that when I was in the Atlantic Coast Conference. It was straight football. The facilities uh, were subpar. You know, good, solid football field, but sometimes it needed some more grass and, and sometimes it needed some tender, loving care that as coaches, a lot of times we had to, to do that ourselves. You, you know, psychologically, sometimes when you can say to a kid, listen, we don't have this or that or the other, they do. So this is what we got to do to beat them. You know, it's kind of like a us against the world syndrome. And we always had that us against the world syndrome that probably helped us. Well, you know what, the thing that I look at that I got from the game, I had coaches that teach me the facts of life. You know, it wasn't just the sports of the game, it was how to go out and perform and how to treat people other than yourself and your family or whatever, you know. So you go out and you just spread the gospel the same way that you go out and perform on the football field. We, we worked on three, and let me say, and I think this separates us, but there are three things. Academic, social, and athletic a bit last. We were improving all three of those, but in that order. And we knew those young men, a lot of them needed, they leaned on us, and we had to be there to offer that shoulder. And I think that was the major difference uh, in, in HBCU football and, and let's see, uh, let's say major college or the other smaller colleges. I think that I think it was more nurturing because we felt we had to do it. It was more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, after practice, before practice, and it was just a close-knit family. And we always said that the family is the nucleus of our society. I think one of the great things too about going to an HBC is that you you do feel like it's family, and you're a part of something. You're a part of something. That, that's really historical and a part of who we are in this country because uh, of the journey and the struggles that we've had. There's a lot of pride there and people make sure that they remind you of uh, the reason that, that you're at these schools and what it represents and the responsibility that you have to make sure that we continue to preserve that history and make sure that we uh, preserve the school for the next generation. There was, a, there was a different kind of a feeling, and that was that feeling of kinship and camaraderie. And more than anything else, certainly there's a feeling of pride and, and that whatever, but there's a tremendous feeling of responsibility. The NFL's history with HBCUs extends beyond the field, where the excellence of great players like Willie Lanier, Michael Strahan, Walter Payton, Jerry Rice, and Doug Williams exemplify the athletic talent produced by these great institutions. Cohen for the touchdown! That same level of talent can be found in the classrooms of HBCU campuses. The NFL exposes students to opportunities our sport offers by supporting and participating in events for students from HBCUs. The Black College Football Hall of Fame has partnered with the NFL on several initiatives regarding HBCUs. Recently, the NFL and the Black College Football Hall of Fame held its third annual quarterback coaching summit. NFL and NCAA assistant coaches took part in the two-day program to experience professional development and networking opportunities with NFL club executives. I guess I'd just say a couple of things. One is this is incredibly important to the National Football League, not just this event, but this effort to um, do the things that are right to create the quality and opportunity for our coaches and our executives and for everybody in the National Football League uh, to be able to advance their careers, uh, particularly for the people of color that we are uh, focusing a lot of these efforts on. You know, the cliche has always been used about uh, pipeline, pipeline. Well, I think you'll see today, and we've seen last year and the year before, the pipeline is full. The most important thing here is to open up the valve and let them out the pipeline. I think it's about an opportunity, no more than an opportunity. Give guys an opportunity and they'll show you the way. 
It is now my honor and privilege to introduce to you a man with great vision and a true leader for the Black College Football Hall of Fame's March to Canton, Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our friend, the president of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, David Baker. Hello, I'm David Baker, president of the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, a place we proudly call the most inspiring place on earth. Today, I'm reaching out with an important message to all leaders everywhere. You know, in the game we honor at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's all about huddling up together. And the huddle is a sacred place where you can tune out the loud cacophony of noise that is so disorienting and chaotic around us and come together as one team. You can stand shoulder to shoulder. You can look in each other's eye. You can see who needs help and who is hurting and who you can trust and rely on. But when you break that huddle with one heartbeat, everybody's on the same page to overcome an important adversary a powerful adversary. And that's what we're doing here today on the road to equality, trying to overcome the adversary of racism and hatred in our society. Regardless of race, religion, uh, politics, or creed, we are all one team of Americans together. When James Harris and Doug Williams first came to myself and my colleague, Joe Horrigan, about having the Black College Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. You know, I thought maybe that should be at the College Football Hall of Fame. But frankly, that wasn't a very good story for them to tell because the reason there were historical black colleges was because they didn't want black Americans going to white colleges. But this was a wonderful story for, frankly, the NFL and the Pro Football Hall of Fame to tell. Because once you got to the NFL, it was, I assure you, all about your character. It's what made James Harris the first starting quarterback in the NFL or Doug Williams the first African-American quarterback to win a Super Bowl at a time when there was actually a belief that a black man couldn't play quarterback. It is the truest manifestation of Martin Luther King saying that he had dreamed of a day when his four children would not be judged by their color, but by the content of their character. And we have wonderful stories to tell about the character in these men's lives, both in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and in the Black College Football Hall of Fame that can change other lives today by building character. That's why we're proud to have the Black College Football Hall of Fame permanently at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. So I hope you'll join our huddle. I hope you'll be a part of this. We would love to have you as a leader of your family, your community, and our country to help America huddle up. God bless you. On behalf of the Black College Football Hall of Fame and my co-host and one of the finest men that I know, Mr. Steve Weish, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope this program provided some history and some understanding. If you haven't already done so, please make a donation or make a bid on the auction items. Also, be sure to save this date. February 21, 2021, for the Black College Football Hall of Fame, which will be holding its 12th annual induction ceremony in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit Black College Football Hall of Fame, that's HOF.org, for more information. And be sure to follow us at BCFHOF on social media. Thank you for joining us tonight. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Coach, this is a hypothetical question, I guess, but what would it take for Doug Williams to make it in the National Football League? An opportunity to play. That's it. Says it all. That's it. <laughs> so, education is the key to equality, it's one of the keys to social justice. As my 96-year-old mother used to tell me frequently when I was a young man, son, you get the proper education and your future will be as bright as the promise of God. What a great experience I had uh, attending Southern University. A lot of fun, great experience, great education, 
a lot of great people around me, a lot of support. Think about going to one of these HBCUs. I guarantee you, you'll love it too. Support the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Support our HBCUs. Help us to encourage others to continue the road to equality. The Black College experience has been one of the greatest experiences of my lifetime. Maxing your support to support our Black Colleges and Universities in the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Help us to continue the road to equality. Help us to preserve the history of our Black Universities and Black College Football Hall of Fame. If you're graduating from high school or in high school at this present time, don't forget, make sure that you put your Black College University on your list. It's an experience that you won't ever forget. George Washington Carver made the statement one time, uh, take what you have, make the best of it, and never be satisfied. We don't complain, or we never complain about what we didn't have, but rather we try to maximize what we did have. Now, when I was approached about broadcasting black college football by Bob Johnson, founder of Black Entertainment Television, back in 1980, needless to say, I was excited. You know, exposure for black college athletics was long overdue, and this was an opportunity to open the eyes of America to the culture of athletics from a black perspective. When I was in high school, there was segregation. We didn't play. Um, the black schools did not play the white schools, and of course what that meant we didn't play each other. We didn't play against white kids. Uh, we often wondered how it would be, but that never came about until about 1966, 67, that era, area. And um, we were never recruited. We weren't recruited by the white schools in the southern part of the country. So therefore, all the historically black schools um, were the schools that we were capable or able to go to be recruited by. The inspirational message that I want to share reflecting the current state of the country. Things look ugly right now, but when it's all over, I hope people begin to realize there is enough America for everybody.